In the summer between my first and second year of graduate school at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, I moved into a trailer park and specifically into a trailer at the very edge of the trailer park and there I wound up adopting some kittens and so this is the story of that and I do have to tell you a little bit about the trailer park which I'll, I'll go into here and I'll tell you a lot more about that in some other some other video so you know trailer parks there's a lot of different kinds of people who live in them and if you live in a university town especially you know the further south you go you might find quite a few of them and they you know they vary considerably some of them are pretty sketchy places some of them are a bit more upscale and <laughs> expensive and have various amenities and the deeper that you go into a trailer park, typically the, the older trailers, at least this was the case back when I was living in and spending time in trailer parks, they would be way towards the back. And my trailer was the second trailer from the very end of the park. As a matter of fact, there was um, something almost like a, a, it was sort of like a dump. They would throw, you know, some garbage there and cover it up with with landfill there was construction stuff that they would dump there and then beyond it it was the railroad tracks at one end of my trailer was a woods that separated off our trailer park from another trailer park and then you know across the dirt road from where we were there wasn't even gravel at, at that place uh or that point in the trailer park there was another woods and so you know it was it was kind of in the countryside it was a little bit out of town but not entirely out of carbondale itself and the trailer that i rented i you know chose the cheapest one i could get they charged me 175 dollars rent per month and you got what you paid for you know the, the trailer was older than me the walls were about this thick poorly insulated the windows, um, you know, you could open them up and then you had to prop them open. And there was, you know, an air conditioner as there is in all of these things. But I, I never turned it on because I knew that the trailer was just leaking, um, you know, cool air. So there, there wasn't any point in it. And, you know, for a young guy, uh, especially somebody in graduate school who was spending most of his time either studying or working out or cooking or things like that it was it was great it was perfect for me you know i had a stipend for my fellowship and you know that 175 dollars plus utilities didn't really cut into it that much so i had plenty of money for you know uh food and beer and and you know things buying books and things like that and there were as you know another feature of, of trailer parks is that there's quite often a lot of stray animals and when you live in a place that has students this is kind of a sad thing students add even more to that because you know undergraduates will adopt a kitten or a puppy and then they'll move back home and they'll leave the animal behind them which is how i got another one of uh, my cats later on black monkey um, but there was a stray and this stray mother cat she had a litter of kittens the first the first year that i was there and there were five of them and these kittens would actually they almost nursed her to death unfortunately they would knock her down and nurse on her and she'd try to you know wean them and get away and eventually she just took off but she was being fed by the people who lived just you know the i was the second trailer at the end of the park then the people who were at the very very end they would they would feed her they were a couple and you know i saw these uh five kittens dwindle you know one of them got hit by a dump truck and most of them were pretty feral there was one of them that i could approach uh, a little white cat but eventually she disappeared as well and so i thought oh that's that's it for them then those neighbors the next the next year in in the spring those neighbors moved and that stray cat that you know mom cat started coming around she was big she was you know she may have had some Maine Coon in her or something like that and I started you know I didn't have cat food as such but I would find stuff that I could give her and you know she'd come up to me and she was quite affectionate and you could tell like she was super super pregnant again and then she disappeared 
and I didn't see her for a long time. And I was, it was like maybe March, April, probably March because it was so warm down there. And I had my trailer door wide open, um, you know, because again, I, I didn't uh, use air conditioning or anything like that. I just opened the windows and I put fans at either end of the trailer. And when it was a nice sunny day, I'd, uh, you know, leave the door open. And so I, I'm just sitting there in my trailer with the door open. And then I hear this little mew, you know, this tiny little little kitten sound. And I look and she's coming up my steps with a kitten in her mouth. I'm sitting over on the couch in my, my living room. And she goes into my kitchen, looks around, and then puts the kitten underneath my refrigerator. My refrigerator had kind of a gap. It was an old-fashioned kind. And I was like, well, that's weird. So, you know, I get up and I look, and sure enough, there's a kitten, like, staring back at me from under the refrigerator. And the mom cat takes off. And then she comes back, and she comes up the steps again with another kitten. (laughs) Shoves that kitten underneath the refrigerator. That kitten goes in there, and I was like, wow, she's, uh, I wonder what she's doing, you know? And so I, I go and sit back on the couch, and I figure out, I'll just leave her alone and see what, what happens. And she brings in two more kittens and puts all of them under the refrigerator, and then she just leaves, you know? She, uh, <laughs> I think she, she didn't want to have too much to do with, with kittens after her first bad experience, And so I go and I look under the refrigerator. I'm like, and there's all these little eyes looking out at me. And, you know, some of them were hissing at me as well. They didn't know what to make of me. So I go and I, you know, put my arm under the refrigerator and I pull a kitten out. And I had like a recycling bin. So I take the recycling bin and put some, you know, some uh, clothes in it and blankets. And I put the first kitten in there and it's looking up at me and, you know, not really sure what's going on. But it was clearly like, you know, uh, weeks old. And so, um, you know, I reach another one out and another one out. And then I can't get the other one because it started to crawl up inside. So I'm like, oh, crap, it better not like get to the mechanism. Uh, You know, I don't know exactly what's in the back of this fridge, but it can't be good for it. And so I had to pull the fridge out and kind of tilt it. I took some of the food out that would be like to be spilling. And there I could see it and I, I reach up and I pull it down and it's hissing at me. That turned out to be the runt of the litter, actually. So now I've got four kittens all in this um, recycling bin. And I, and I thought, well, I mean, this is a kind of temporary solution because they're going to, you know, go to the bathroom in, in these clothes and stuff like that. I better start thinking about how to take care of uh, some kittens and what what am I going to do with them? Should I like take them to somebody else or what 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 should I do? So long story short, you know, I uh the mom cat came back and you know, she would like lay down and I I'd let the kittens out of their little box. They'd go over and nurse on her and then wander around the the uh trailer and then the mom cat would take off. You know, she she wasn't interested in sticking around. And she um you know, she, she'd go out in the woods or do whatever she was going to do. You know, I'd give her some, some food and then she didn't want to be with the kittens all that much. She was like, they're your, your problem. And then interestingly, the people who were, who had, you know, left, who had lived next door, they came back and they knocked on my door and they're like, so, you know, we, we, um, I, I guess I must've told some people and, you know, they were like, well, you know, there's those kittens and the mom cat, we'd like to take them all. And I said, well, you can have the mom cat, but I'm, I'm keeping the kittens. You know, I've been taking care of them and I'm getting kind of attached to them. I actually called them the four musketeers. So, you know, one of them was Aramis, one of them was Porthos, one of them was uh, Athos, and one of them was D'Artagnan. And I forget which ones I named which other than the runt was named Athos because she was mean. You know, there was something like clearly... A little bit wrong with her. She wasn't misshapen or anything, but she had a, a terrible temper, which was like Athos, right? And I think the two that I ended up keeping were Porthos, who there were two girls and two boys. And so Porthos and D'Artagnan. And actually, let me describe them a little bit. So they were big, big little kittens. And as it turns out, we figured out that, you know, the mom cat was, was pretty giant. There was also this, this tom cat around that we called. 
uh, Big Boo. And he was kind of brain damaged. He lived with an alcoholic in a trailer. And I guess the guy used to beat him and probably gave him some brain damage. But he also would get in fights with, like, all the other cats and with other animals. He had scars all over him. And Boo was pretty friendly, but he'd kind of lose his mind every so often. So he'd, like, come up to your trailer and, you know, you start petting him and talking to him. And he'd be purring and all that. And then suddenly he'd turn around and try to bite you, you know. And he, his head was, like, this big. And he was, he was just a giant cat. So, you know, the, the two girls were, I guess they call it like, like tortoiseshell or something, where it's, it's black and white and brown all kind of mixed together. And then the two boys were both um, just, you know, black and white with, you know, like patterns and stuff like that. Some of them had, they almost looked like they had goatees or mustaches, which is, I think, where I came up with the musketeer thing. And, you know, word got around that, that I had uh, kittens and this friend of mine, Chris, who uh, was studying philosophy, we used to call him the illustrated man, all sorts of stories about him. He was a tattoo artist as well as a philosopher from California and licensed piercer, which meant that in Carbondale, he could like set whatever price he wanted, work wherever he wanted. He was like covered from head to toe in, in tattoos. And uh, he took one of the boys... And I think he called him Dion, perhaps. And, you know, I'd, I'd see him when I'd go over to Chris's place and, you know, we'd play. And he was an inside-outside cat. You know, they let him kind of roam a bit. And I was going out with this, uh, this uh, woman at the time. And it was a, one of those relationships where we could tell there wasn't an awful lot of uh, future there. So when she moved back to St. Louis for uh, the summer with her sister... You know, we were like, well, this is this is it. And I and she was like, well, I'd like to take the, the runt. Uh, you know, I want to take this this kitten. And so I was like, OK, that's cool. You know, uh, and then there were two. And for for a while, I was calling them, you know, by their their three their four musketeer names. But, you know, after a while, you just kind of drop that. And I started calling them little boy and little girl. And that became their main names as well as all sorts of other names that they got called, you know, little girl got called little bit, little bit of kitlet, uh, bitlet, uh, little boy got called, you know, fuzzy bear, fuzzy cow because of the black and white stuff. And, and he grew very, very quickly, quicker than she did. Although she became a pretty big cat as well. Little boy's head was like his father's. It was like this big around. He, you know, when, when he was in his prime, you could like give him a, a, you know, like a chicken bone and he could, like a leg bone and he could crack it with his, with his teeth and his jaws. And, you know, his, his, uh, his fangs were, were big. Everything about the, the guy was big and he developed quicker than his, his sister. At his top weight, he was 25 pounds. Now, he was also fat, right? So, but the vet would take a look at him and say, well, that cat should be 20 pounds, you know? So he was, he was gigantic uh, as far as cats go. Well, maybe not for some people, but, you know, most people would look at him and go, wow, that's a big cat. And little girl was, you know, not as big as little boy, but she was also pretty big. And both of them were very agile. Um, little girl would like jump up from the floor to my shoulder. I used to call her little parrot. That's right. Cause she would sit on my shoulder and just like look around, you know? Um, and you know, I, I, I lived with them in that trailer for years and years in graduate school. And then, you know, they got, they, they got to go outside, but I would put them on little cat leashes. I would, uh, you know, they had collars and I would tie some clothesline and then they could wander around the yard. Every once in a while, a little boy would figure out how to throw his collar and then I'd have to go looking for him. Sometimes he'd be in the woods. Sometimes he'd be messing around, you know, a couple trailers up. Sometimes he'd be over in the dump area. And little girl liked to climb trees. And then I would have to actually climb. I mean, there were two trees in, in my uh, yard. I would have to climb the tree because she couldn't figure out how to get back down. And she'd have the leash on her. So I'd, I'd climb the tree, take the leash off of her, and then um, she would get on my shoulder and, like, sink her claws <laughs> into me. And then I'd climb back down, you know. And, um, you know, we, we'd, we'd, like, hang out and... Uh, um, just, 
I'd read a book and they'd, you know, purr and curl up with me or they'd play with each other. Sometimes they'd play with me. I do have a couple other kind of cool stories about them. One day I came home and this is when they were still pretty little kittens, like about this big. And I, I get, I get in, I think I came back from the grocery store, which was, you know, about half a mile down the road and I can't find them anywhere. And I'm calling for them. Where are you, little boy, little girl, you know? And I, I started to get really worried. I go out in the yard. I'm looking for them. No sign of them anywhere. And then suddenly I hear like a little, like a yawn. They were in the silverware drawer where there were <laughs> these um, cloth napkins. And, you know, everything in a trailer is kind of rickety, apparently there's there was like a hole between the closet that the garbage was in which they could open up and the, the sets of drawers and somehow they figured out both of them that that was a cool place to be when i opened that drawer there they were both of them like nested together in in that spot um, that trailer as i mentioned was uh you know, poorly insulated. So in the summer, I would set up fans at either end of it, but it could get to, you know, 100 degrees in that trailer. And in the winter, um, you know, again, poorly insulated, I would actually set the thermostat at either 60 degrees or 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So in the winter, we all, you know, curled up and cuddled up together. And in the summer, the cats would actually like, you know, go in the bathroom, which was the coolest room because it had like tile and they, they would pant like dogs. And I, I thought that was really quite strange. You know, I made sure to keep the water um, well, well stocked and, and all of that. And they were, you know, really, really great cats. They uh, ended up, you know, following, well, being taken along to Indiana when I, uh, purchased one of the houses on my family's land with my inheritance from my, my mother's estate after she died. And then they became completely inside outside cats and would range all over the place um, along with the other cats that, that we had at the time. And they lived to be quite old. Unfortunately, um, my, my uh, ex did something pretty terrible which is when, when, you know, I was living in, in North Carolina, um, she asked me, well, what are you going to do with these cats? And I said, well, I think you're going to have to keep them because, you know, the, the kids like them and all that. And she took both of them to a shelter at 13, 14 years old and just abandoned them there. But we had some, some you know, we had over a decade of, of really great time together, me and those, those two kittens, little boy and little girl, um, I used to call him also, you know, the Fuzzy Bumble, and and uh, she had all sorts of other names as well. And uh, they were, you know, some some really great cats, kind of a fixture in my life for a long time. Now, if they were alive, I think they'd probably be around, you know, 25 or so, which would really be pushing it for a cat. Um but yeah, they they were really quite something. So that's that's that story. I'll tell some more cat stories some other time.